dealt with the aspects of uh, due process as understood by the American Constitution. And thereafter, its import into the Indian Constitution is what I intend dealing with in today's lecture. The manner in which it was brought in and the form in which it existed for a while and the transformation which took place in the concept over a period of time, they all bear relevance and need to be understood. When the constitutional debates were happening, the Constituent Assembly was constituted and the debates were happening. At that point of time, it was decided that the debate essentially centered on this as to whether to import the concept of due process the way it was in the American Constitution. Or the concept needed a little bit of watering down and on this the debate was pretty in intense. You all know that the constituent assembly as far as the drafting of the constitution was concerned it had Baba Sahib Ambedkar as the chairperson and it had various members who debated on various issues and this being one of the main major issues a lot of thought was put into it. At that point of time, Dr. C. R. Rao, one of the constituent members and who was also part of the erstwhile Indian civil service, he was also interested with the job of inquiring and looking into the working of this concept in various constitutions. And with that purpose, he undertook journeys abroad visited countries like England, Ireland, the US and even Canada to explore as to how this concept was looked into. And during that process, he also had discussions with various legal luminaries including judges and including some Supreme Court judges of the United States, which is relevant in the sense that Justice Frankfurter, who was one of the very well-known judges of the United States Supreme Court at that point of time was also consulted by him and the advice which was rendered by Justice Frankfurter in fact was in synchrony with what I had discussed yesterday that there was a section of judges who felt that the concept of due process needs to be further seen with this prism of lesser judicial scrutiny of laws made by parliament and there should be some kind of deference to the legislative intent and the legislative purpose which is, you know, which goes into the process of making the law. So Justice Frankfurter was of this opinion, of this section of our judges who had this kind of opinion. I had told you the case also which brought about the divide, the New York case, the Baker's case, where the views got divided more or less into nearly 60-40 as a 5 to 4 kind of a majority in that judgment. So he even in his discussions with Mr. Rao had in fact advised that due process otherwise as I had stated at that point of time is a diffused concept and would in a way you know bring in kind of judicial control over the legislative process. So this was one view which was expressed during the constitutional debates, during the constituent assembly debates. And there were protractors and detractors of this view, people who wanted the due process as such. You had people like A.M. Munshi who wanted the due process to be included the way it was because he was a champion of individual rights. You had a person like Govind Pant who went on to become the chief minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh who said otherwise. He wanted it to be watered down. And Ambedkar, of course, considering the diverse opinions, decided to go by the way the House would decide. In fact, what is important is that the subcommittee, which was dealing with the aspect of fundamental rights, 
in fact in its draft the first draft that it had brought out in that draft it had included the concept of due process see the process is such that the subcommittee will draft the concerned provision and the provision will be put to debate so at the time when the draft was brought in the provision in fact spoke about due process now article 21 as you see today does not talk about due process it talks about procedure established by law whereas the draft the first initial draft which was put to debate it not talk about procedure established by law it talked about due process no person shall be deprived of his personal liberty without the due process of law and it included not only personal not only included liberty it also spoke about uh, the fact that uh, the property of the person would also be not deprived without the due process of law so the word used by the committee initially then that was the view was that the word should be due process now but post the debate and considering all views ultimately they came to the conclusion that you know this would be giving too much of power in the hands of the judiciary and it would enable the judiciary to essentially control the legislative power of the parliament so therefore they decided to water down the concept saying this that we cannot have faith in the judges in this that you know they would not exceed their powers and therefore they watered down the concept and brought in what is now known in article 21 as procedure established by law the word due process was changed and it came with this that no person shall be deprived of his personal liberty life or personal liberty except by the procedure established by law so it this change was effected so the concept because due process otherwise i when i had explained the concept there i had said that you know there was an aspect of substantive rights which were developed by judges using this concept and there were procedural safeguards also which were built in so here was a scenario where the constituent assembly devised a scenario where only a procedural safeguard in a way was inbuilt the substantive part the intent was to keep it away you know if you if you look at it from that point of view so having said this article 21 came in the shape that it is now what we need to do is when we look at it that how this concept over a period of time the supreme court has looked into it and interpreted it so the journey in relation to this i would say the journey of the due process of law in india because ultimately the supreme court also went during the course of interpretations it has more or less brought the concept akin to what exists in the united states as a due process so the journey of the due process if we need to look into will be beginning with ak gopalan and it will move from ak gopalan to various judgments and probably finally get crystallized with the manaka gandhi's case so now what we will do is that we will also try and take the path which this due process concept has taken retrace the steps and see how the development of this law took place and place it within the context of criminal law as well without forgetting the refrain that the refrain is to examine it from the prism of the effect of the constitution in terms of the development of criminal law as well so we'll look at it from that concept from that point of view so to begin with we will start with ak gopal now post the coming in to force of the indian constitution one of the major landmark cases which took place at that point of time after the constitution was enacted ak gopalan at that point of time was the secretary of the communist party of india so ak gopalan came up with this petition before the supreme court wherein 
he placed a challenge on article 22 now article 22 all of you being lawyers would know and being students of law at some point of time would have studied this deals with preventive detention now the interesting part is that india would probably go down as one of the only nations in the world which has preventive detention enshrined as a fundamental right if you see that it is in chapter 3 that a chap a chapter which is devoted to fundamental rights of citizens has got a provision of depriving a person of his liberty even before the commission of an offence this will probably be one of the only constitutions which will be having a provision of this kind so preventive detention this concept which is there in article 22 was challenged by apk gopal wherein he said that this essentially is in conflict with his rights under article 19 If you look into Article Nineteen, Article Nineteen has got various freedoms in it. It includes freedom of travel, freedom of free passage anywhere all over the country. It has freedom of speech and expression also within it. So he brought about a challenge wherein he said that by Article Twenty Two, what you are doing is that when you are arresting a person without a trial, without a charge. on the apprehension of his coming of his commission of an offence of course the commission of an offence will have to do with the security and maintenance of order in relation to the integrity of the country and sovereignty of the country that that apart but when you do that on an apprehension you are essentially depriving him of his rights under article 19 as well you are restricting his movements completely and without a formal charge based on an apprehension of the executive you are depriving him of these fundamental rights which you cannot they are both in a way interlinked so this issue came up before the supreme court and what did the supreme court do because it was also in a way the supreme court was asked to consider these aspects so there were three four major aspects of course it's a lengthy judgment and i would recommend that each one of these judgments which i am dealing with i would say cursorily in by way of these lessons these are only indicators you will have to go into the thought process of judges by looking into those judgments yourself and reading those judgments for a better understanding so what did the supreme court do there were two three major aspects in it one whether these rights were interlinked whether these rights were interlinked that 19 was interlinked with 21 did it have a bearing though the object was essentially to see to it that the maintenance of the, the security of the state was being involved and in relation to that the object was claimed that preventive detention was being done because of that to maintain that aspect but the effect was it was having an effect on the other freedoms so the object was something else the effect was something else so in order to achieve one particular object could you infringe could it have an effect of infringing other rights that was one aspect the other aspect was that if you look into article 22 224 and 227 if i am mistaken i if i am i am if you look into the constitution you will find that these two provisions 4 and 7 now as far as 4 is concerned it talks about preventive detention which is authorized but for a period of 3 months beyond 3 months the preventive detention has to come up before an advisory board which also comprises of judges and the advisory board then thereafter will have to approve of any further detention that is what one of the so called safeguards which is inbuilt into 224 and 227 in fact speaks about a situation where there can be a dispensation of 
you can dispense with an advisory board now that power to dispense with an advisory board has been given to the parliament so there was a distinction between 4 and 7 4 something which could be done both by the parliament and the legislature and 7 which would be done only by the parliament so this was another aspect 4 and 7 so an argument was raised that 4 in fact was even more draconian then uh, 7 was even more draconian than 4 where even the adversary board can be done away with so some modicum of you know a check and balance even that is gone again based on the whims of an executive so the court was seized of the said situation and when the court was seized of this kind of a scenario the court surprisingly took a very narrow view in fact one of the interesting arguments which was raised was raised from a situation which happened in England way back at the time when Henry the seventh or the Henry the eighth was ruling now Henry the eighth was a much married man he married some six times during his course of his reign and his life and interestingly amongst the six wives that he had because you know Christian law doesn't allow separation very easily we had on an earlier occasion also talked about this in relation to some other context so generally though so the six wives that he had he was not having an heir so the idea of marrying and remarrying again was also to have an heir now in this kind of a scenario those six wives some of them got beheaded because he brought false charges of treason against them and on a charge of treason they were beheaded and some of them got divorced of course with the help of the church of England where the church was a little amenable to him he managed that and only one of them survived survived meaning whereby that she outlived him so that was a very interesting kind of a scenario which happened in relation to his personal life now why I am saying all that because the third wife whom he married was a, was a person by the name of Anne Boleyn before that he was married to Catherine you must have heard of this queen Catherine now during that period in between when he was trying to effect a divorce from Catherine and he required the help of the Church of England and the Church of England was not very helpful to his cause so during that point of time he was having a running feud with the bishop the bishop of a place called Rochester now when this feud was happening the cook of the bishop of Rochester one Richard it came to light that there was an attempt to poison the bishop his meat had been poisoned but as luck would have it, the bishop did not want to have meat that night and fed some of his friends and an old widow who was being looked after by the church. And when they partook that meat, the poisoned meat, two of them died and the others fell ill. Subsequently, this man, the man who had poisoned the meat, the cook, on interrogations, accepted the fact that he had done it though he took a plea saying this that it was only a prank that he was playing and he thought that it was not poison but it was something which would upset the stomach of his friends this plea was of course not accepted but interestingly at that point of time the king intervened at the time when he was imprisoned in the tower of london 
and the trial was to start. Instead of a trial happening, the king intervened and of course the motives which are being attributed later on were this that Anne Boleyn probably had a hand, Anne Boleyn and her relatives had a hand in trying to administer the poison to the bishop. So in order to you know, do away the suspicion in relation to that, the king had intervened, showing sympathy to the entire cause. And what he decreed was a new form of sentence where he said that the cook would be boiled in oil as a sentence for treason. So for a murder which took place, which had nothing to do with the affairs of the state, it was declared to be a part of a conspiracy to commit treason and one of the new sentences which was brought in was that he would be boiled on a vat of oil in the ground which was right next to the Tower of London. So this sentence was carried out. Now why I gave all this long-winded story? This long-winded story was given because one of the argument, interesting arguments which was raised in A.K. Gopalan was this, that in the case of King Henry, the boiling of a person was a procedure which was established by law, if you look at it. But it is not that kind of a procedure which is envisaged. It was argued that this cannot be said to be right procedure. And when the matter was heard, except for Justice Fazal Ali, who gave a dissenting and minority judgment in A.K. Gopalan, all other judges, and with the major judgment being written by Justice Das, came to the conclusion that procedure established by law, any procedure which is established by law, cannot be challenged. That, as per that procedure, whatever is contemplated, that needs to be carried by letter and spirit, number one. The other aspect which they held was that Article 19, a right to freedom, is given to a free man. Since in the case of preventive detention, the man is already in custody. So therefore, he would not have any rights under Article 19. This is a very detrimental kind of view which was taken. And the third aspect which also came in was this, that our, the, our fundamental rights exist in separate brackets, meaning whereby that there can be no effect of Article 21's, when you are examining Article 21, you need not look into the effect that it will have in relation to the other freedoms or the other articles. So 21 has to be interpreted to be distinct and separate from 19. So these were the views which were taken by a 11 judge bench in 1960 or 1950 in A.K. Gopalan's case. The judgment in A.K. Gopalan, for those of you who would be interested in going through it, will be AAR 1950 Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. AIR 1950 SC 27. Very good. So you have it. <coughs> 1950 was the time when it was delivered. So the, these were the kind of views which came up when Gopalan came in. And Gopalan stood sway for a period of nearly a decade. For a decade it held sway till such time that R.C. Cooper's matter, Coas G. R.C. Cooper in 1963 or so, I will again come with the citation, which is also known as the bank nationalization case, which happened, which revisited this and then thereafter overrode this position of A.K. Gopalan. But in the meanwhile, I also need to discuss two very important cases which came up before the Supreme Court where Justice Subarao wrote some very progressive judgments and it was Justice Subarao who showed the way
and in a way also highlighted the fact that the view which was taken by Justice Fazal Ali was the right view. Not the view which was taken by Justice Das, but the view taken by Justice Fazal Ali. I, in fact, would uh, uh, like to read a small paragraph to show the distinction between these two contrasting views which were taken, the minority view and the view which was given by Justice Das. Justice Das's view, if you see, is a small paragraph which I wanted to highlight. And this is from para 285 of the said judgment, where Justice Das said, if parliament may take away life by providing for hanging by the neck, logically there can be no objection if it provides a sentence of death by shooting, by a firing squad, or by gluten, or in the electric chair, or even by boiling in oil. Just remember, because that boiling in oil <laughs> analogy came from what happened in King Henry's times and what was argued. A procedure laid down by the legislature may offend against the court's sense of justice and fair play. And a sentence provided by the legislature may outrage the court's notions of penology. But that is a wholly irrelevant consideration. So this is the extent till which Justice Das went to hold judicial property in a way of not interfering with what procedure was laid down by the legislature. That the court's just sense of justice and fair play should not intervene. So this was the early stages of constitutional development which was taking place. And in those early stages, quite a bit of this is reminiscent of the kind of debate that you saw at the Constituent Assembly debates. The views that were taken, for instance, by Govind Ballab Pant and people towards that end who talked about lesser amount of interference and a watering down of the provision of due process, that was the kind of view which was adopted in A.K. Bhopalan to a great extent. Now, having said that, interestingly, this view was also influenced because in the Constituent Assembly debates, I forgot one thing and that is what Justice Fazal Ali spoke of in the minority judgment that he wrote. I used to always wonder, you know, that why do, supposing, you know, there is a bench of five people or say a bench of seven or a bench of eleven, why is it that one or two people, once they are not in agreement, why is it that a dissenting judgment is written? What is the importance of a dissenting judgment? In the earlier stages of your life, when you read, you find that, you know, there is a majority judgment or there are judgments which are written by every judge. He will concur, but yet he will be giving a judgment of his own. The reasoning will be different or there will be a dissent. The importance you realize that, you know, at that point of time, maybe the majority carries the day. But since law is always organic and when situations demand thereafter, when it is revisited, Better sense prevails, you have the wisdom of others available to you by way of these judgments. And then you realize that probably this was the right view. The one which was the dissenting judgment was the right view. And that is exactly that happened post Gopalan. Because in Gopalan's matter, it was only Fazal Ali who essentially disagreed and wrote a dissenting judgment separately. And that judgment, there, that dissenting judgment thereafter became the fulcrum of the development of this branch till Menaka Gandhi thereafter. Because in that judgment, Justice Fazal Ali wrote that it is not a question that the effect will not be looked into. Because here the Supreme Court also said that what the object needs to be looked into, the effect that it may have in relation to other rights need not be looked into. But Justice Fazal Ali deferred on this and said that no, not only the object but the effect also needs to be looked into. And a deprivation of liberty, to a certain extent, will also impinge Article 19 and the rights therein. So this was a view which he had taken at that point of time. One of the arguments which was raised at the time of the Constituent Assembly, when the debate was on in relation to due process and procedure established by law, one of the arguments which was put forth was this, that at that point of time, if you remember, Japan was also a country which post-World War 
to a certain extent its constitution was also being written to aid them in this task the united states brought assistance and encouragement japan's new constitution compiled under american guidance laid the framework for democracy it gave the people the right to exercise their sovereignty through their elected representatives as a result the phenomenon of free elections and in the constitution new constitution of japan which came into force in 1949 probably a year before india in that constitution the new constitution of japan in fact was written by a group of lawyers constitutional lawyers who were requisitioned at that time by the americans because you need to understand that post world war 2 and post hiroshima and nagasaki and post all that after the axis powers were defeated there was a kind of a us administered supreme commander of forces who was deputed there and of course there was there were other countries also which were involved in it but essentially more of usa and the supreme commander at that point of time decided that on the behest of the various governments that japan should also have a written constitution and that written constitution was taking time from 1945 onwards the committee had been set up but nothing was happening so in 1949 they decided to bring in american lawyers to also try and draft the constitution and in that constitution which the american lawyers drafted the due process was changed to procedure established by law so this was also one of the arguments which was raised at the time of the constituent assembly debates which finds a reflection in justice fazal ali's judgment wherein he says that it is strange and surprising that we have to subscribe to a view which was taken by not the american government as such not by the elected american government and the elected representatives who formed the constituent assembly of the united states of america and then thereafter who gave the concepts of due process but what is being followed is what is being determined by an occupational force there though it may be of america but not the elected government and we are trying to follow that procedure established by law instead of due process of law which the country otherwise is following where the elected government of that country post its war of independence and its constituent assembly decided instead of adhering to that we are adhering to this because it was general macarthur who was governing the entire process at that point of time as the supreme commander of the forces there and it was under his aegis that this whole thing was being drafted of course with the concurrence of the american government as well so the idea was to water down this broad brush which the judges would have otherwise to paint and narrow it and confine it within the procedures as was attempted and done in the indian situation as well out here so speaking about this and after ek gopalan for nearly a decade since it was a constitution bench judgment which rendered this judgment so to overrule it you had to have a bench which would probably have the same strength and justice rao who happened to be on benches thereafter do professed a different view and expressed this that probably the time had come to revisit gopalan and the time had come and where he also expressed that there were a section of judges who felt that it was fazal ali's view which should be taken into consideration but yet in the judgments that he wrote in between he also since they were of lesser strength than the 11 judge bench which gave that judgment he decided that it cannot be overruled but he gave his own independent views and interpreted things in a different way which showed the way thereafter mm-hmm. 